Before the sermon this morning, I'm going to make a shameless announcement. Um, for the first time in a while, our church is going to have a Lenten study. And beginning tomorrow evening, um, on, between the hours of 7 and 8 on Zoom, um, we're going to discuss uh, climate change. Um, it's called God's Earth, Our Call. And uh, continuing for the four remaining uh, Mondays in March, we're going to look at the climate crisis and our responsibility as people of faith to address it. You can find the Zoom connection in the bulletin or in the, um, the mission uh, minute. Um, and if you need help with that, please contact the office. But um, I hope to communicate this morning that the season of Lent is particularly suited for us to examine our relationship to the earth and this important um, ecological crisis. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. From dust you came and to dust you shall return. Um, with these words, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday for many people. And many of you may have either come to the church or wherever you were, received the ashes as a symbol on your forehead on Wednesday. When I think of ashes to ashes, um, in today's world, I can't help but think of the literal ashes that we've seen in the climate crisis that our planet is having. Ash like snow is the common refrain that we hear. And that's how many residents describe that infamous 2018 campfire in paradise. 86 people lost their lives. Many more were unaccounted for and displaced. In January 2020, a bookstore in uh, the town of Cobargo, South New Wales in Australia posted a sign in the entrance to the bookstore. It said, post-apocalyptic fiction has been moved to current events. <laughs> that sign was in reference to the fires in the Australia that year. But it, I think it could be a sign that's repeated over and over in reference to all these increased disasters that we're seeing across the planet. And it does feel apocalyptic. It's as if we're watching slow, painful end to existence, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I don't have to convince most people here that um, climate change is real, um, nor do I probably have to convince you that humans are the primary cause um, but since the Industrial Revolution, more than one trillion tons of carbon produced by human activity is now suspended in our atmosphere. Now, to put that in perspective, that's the total mass of every human-built structure and object on Earth. I think the issue for us is what do we do about it? There's no denying the Earth has a temperature and the land is in pain. And if we're honest, sometimes I think it's a motivation issue. It's an issue of passion. Um, in a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, some of you may be familiar with the book. Um, she, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a, a member of the uh, citizen Potawatomi Nation. She's also a scientist. And she's written this book um, about her experience but more importantly about the climate. And she says, it's not just the land that's broken. More importantly, it's our relationship to the land that's broken. What we need is not ecological restoration alone. We need a restoration of the relationship between people and the rest of creation. A restoration of relationship. Well, what does our Christian faith say about our relationship 
to the earth. In the church where I grew up, we used to sing a song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Are you familiar with the song, I'll fly away? <laughs> Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a land beyond God's celestial shore, I'll fly away. This world is not my home. Popular bumper sticker today, have you seen it? Um, indeed, if this is your worldview, I'm, I'm not sure climate change is going to be high on the agenda. The story that we read this morning, our creation story, tells us a very different relationship. The story tells of a gardening God who plays in the dirt. And thank you so much for that reading this morning. <laughs> it was, um, here's a picture of a God who scoops and shapes fresh loam into a new form and intimately brings that to his mouth, nostril to nostril, and animates with breath. Remember the poem this morning, God scooped the clay, and by the bank of the river he kneeled down, and there the great almighty God who lit the sun and fixed the sky, who flung the stars to the far most corner of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand, this great God, like a mammy bending over her baby, kneeled down in the dust, toiling over a lump of clay, Till he shaped it in his own image. The land came first. Did you notice in the story and in the scripture this morning? Toiling over a lump of clay. We can never forget that we are from the soil. Ashes to ashes. From the dust you came. From the dust you shall return. The story continues. He blew the breath of life and man became a human soul. So intimate, so loving. The scriptures consistently link our life to the breath of God, lives animated and dependent upon God. The breath of God in my nostrils, Job will say in the Old Testament. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Christians in the New Testament would reiterate this. In one of the earliest Christian sermons, Paul says, In God we live and move and have our being. In God we live and move and have our being. And then the creation story is told in the New Testament in a unique way. Over and over, the New Testament relates creation to the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to the poetry that Paul uses in the book of Colossians. All things were created by him, Jesus, both in heaven and on earth. All things were created through him and for him. In him, all things hold together. And here's the point. At the core of everything that God created, the core of everything, is God's self-giving love. Paul will even make the startling claim in the New Testament that at the core and the center of creation is the cross. Self-giving love, the center of all creation. You see that God stooping in the dirt, creating humanity. There are other symbols than ashes this morning that remind us of who we are. At this, mor this morning, we'll come together at the communion table where we will take the very earthly bread, the earthly wine. And these symbols point to our core truth of our faith, our creation story which is that love animates everything. 
When we say as Christians, in God we live and we move and we have our being, we're saying that we live and we exist in God's self-giving love. The whole world, this love is the center of all that was made. We're fashioned from the soil and God's loving breath, and he places us in a garden. The gardener God creates gardeners. We're called to till it and to keep it. Words that indicate a relationship with the earth. Some translations call it keep it, watch it, care for it. And that's what we're created to be and do. <clears throat> In the West, for centuries, um, we sometimes think of humanity as being at the top, you know, the pinnacle of all evolution. The consequence is that we often confuse our uniqueness and separateness uh, as being separate from the earth, becoming detached from the rest of creation. At worst, the earth just kind of exists for us to mine, to keep taking from, to satisfy our evolving needs. But if we truly exist in the love of God, and we truly are gardeners with the gardening God, then we know where our attention needs to be. Our effort must be to heal the land and live in loving ways to the earth and its inhabitants. To follow a self-loving, self-giving God. For God so loved the world. I think we accept, most of us would probably accept this, that we're created in the love of God and from the soil but we still kind of feel overwhelmed with the climate crisis. What do we do? What do we do to make a practical difference? This, these are big issues and they seem to require a lot of political will, government policy, things that are really, sometimes we feel like out of our control. What can we do to make a practical difference? This morning, I wanna go back to just our time of Lent. From the dust you came to the dust you shall return. And for many of us during Lent, there are spiritual practices involved. Maybe some of us give up things for Lent. Some of us take on new responsibilities. Some of us begin to love dogs. <laughs> It's a way for us to focus our attention. Um, maybe to just shift and look at things in a different way. To allow, the, to open up a space, if you will, to allow the Holy Spirit to redirect our thinking. Sometimes it could lead to more permanent life-altering change. New habits will develop, new, new thinking about our relationships to others and, and the earth. Climate change is overwhelming. It's taking place over decades, but Lent is six weeks. What can you practice during this time? Amen.